and uh, I'll do my best to cover this topic in a timely fashion and uh, keep everyone as engaged as possible. So uh, just to start off, I am a consultant to the Capacity Assessment Office in the Ministry of the Attorney General in Ontario. But to let you know, <clears throat> I am not a capacity assessor, which is an interesting position for me to be in. I'm a consultant and I help assessors, but I'm not actually a trained and designated assessor. And I also didn't write the guidelines. You might find the guidelines helpful and interesting, but I didn't actually write those. So I've not received financial support um, for this program. And um, this program, you can see all the various disclosures here uh, in terms of, of the uh, program. And I'm not gonna be discussing specifically the Capacity Assessment Office. I'm certainly happy to speak to that a little bit, but it's not the main focus here. And um, this is the other mitigating potential bias, basically. Um, I'm gonna make my best recommendations for you uh, and do my best to make it evidence-based, which is hard in this topic. So I'm gonna to try to talk to you a little bit about the concept of decision-making capacity, identify a process that I think of as my sort of steps one to nine when I'm thinking about how do I assess capacity? How do I approach that? And then really to help you recognize the consent capacity laws locally will really be how you determine how you proceed because this wonderful country of ours, we have different laws in different regions and how you use the laws is really gonna be very site specific. And I've been around lawyers too long, so I can tell you that I'm not providing legal advice and I'm not providing any advice for those of you who are so brave as to want to be expert witnesses, which I have not done. So I wanted to get a sense from you guys what some of the common challenges you face when dealing with consent and capacity issues in your practice. And as I mentioned to David, I can't see the chat box, unfortunately. So um, if you'd be so kind to kind of type in some uh, options so I get a sense of where you're struggling, what the challenges are, and then David will help me by uh, reading out some of your responses and I can write them down. Any brave souls, David? Got one so far on, on the fact that capacity can fluctuate and how, okay. do, you do, how do you handle that? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That usually comes up first. Any other thoughts? Uh, issues of predatory marriage. Oh boy, okay, yeah, interesting. Um, the right to live at risk. Okay, yeah. Uh, capacity when substances and mental health are involved. Okay. Uh, consent to treatment versus capacity to consent. Uh, vulnerable seniors living alone. Uh, who are um, refusing support and, and making not so good choices in our estimation. Um, communication barriers such as hearing loss, language, cultural differences. Okay, um, that, that's a great start. I'm sure we'll <laughs> put in a hundred more and I see there's many more comments. So we'll leave it at that and I apologize, but uh, that's a great start. And it gives me a sense that you're all over the map, which is good because those are all really common important issues. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you very much. So I like this definition from a neuropsychology colleague in Alberta, which is uh, trying to kind of think about capacity in the broadest sense, which is that capacity is the ability, and that word ability is really important, to use cognitive processes to understand and identify options, appreciate consequences of different options, and to follow through with chosen options. So that's the definition. You can imagine trying to assess that is quite challenging. And the main issue to, to realize and to remember is that a person is presumed to be capable, but if there's evidence to override this presumption and evidence that's facing you that says, hmm, maybe there's a problem here, you're allowed to question capacity and to think about it and to go further and to explore that. These are the most vul likely vulnerable groups. You can see it doesn't just involve older adults, but it involves a whole range of individuals that you might come across in different parts of your work. So people who've got intellectual disabilities, people with psychiatric disorders, people with neurodegenerative disorders, and then acquired brain neurological disorders, which could be everything from people who have acquired brain injuries to other kinds of neurological disorders. So it's a broad range of folks. And you can imagine trying to devise legislation or formats or tools to deal with all these different groups is a real challenge. 
The other really interesting issue and the biggest one for us today is that capacity is task specific. So you can be capable to do one thing or to make one decision, but not be capable to do another. So for instance, you could be capable to grant power of attorney for property, but not be capable to manage your own finances yourself. It's very much situation and context specific. So you're already starting to hear people talk about language, values, living at risk, all those kinds of things. It's very much that individual in their situation, in their setting. And the biggest issue for us uh, dealing with a national audience is that it's jurisdiction specific. So the law is different in every single province, God help us, every single territory. There's some commonalities and that there's some basic principles, but the law is different. Who gets to do what uh, in different provinces is very, very different. So capacity is not lack of education about a decision. So if you haven't told someone about a treatment or you're approaching someone who's just have to take over the finances because their spouse died and knows nothing about the finances, you can't decide whether they're incapable unless you've educated them about the treatment or educated them about their financial situation. It's not the score on an MMSC or MOCA as much as the lawyers are now using, God help us, those uh, scales and those screening tools. Although executive functioning and processing speed might be most predictive. It's not agreement with us. It's not determined by the diagnosis. It's not low risk behavior and it's not wishes. So some people have wishes which aren't necessarily capable wishes or wishes are not consent. So the interesting thing to, to kind of think about is the differences between a clinical assessment you might be engaged in and when you're asked to take your hat off and think about assessing capacity. And this is really challenging and I, I see this with new assessors. We trained new assessors about a year and a half ago, two years ago in, in Ontario, new capacity assessors. And they're used to doing clinical assessments, but to take that hat off and now do assessments of capacity is really challenging. So when we do clinical assessments, we're thinking of diagnosis and treatment. We're thinking about solving problems. We're really good problem solvers. We're trying to help our clients solve problems. We're trying to do what's best for our patients or clients, help them thrive. We're doing a mental status. We might be doing some cognitive testing. We might be doing some functional assessments. In contrast, when you're trying to assess whether someone's capable for a certain decision, it's a capacity determination. We're determining if someone's rights might be removed. We're going to be asking specific questions regarding that decisional capacity in that situation and that context. And there may be specific legal requirements in your province or jurisdiction, certain forms you have to use, certain protocols you have to follow based on the law in your region. So the main thing I often like to think about is Carol's often thinking about lining up her ducks in a row. And often people are coming to me or others with questions about is this person capable or not? And they're hoping that that determination of capacity will somehow solve the problem. And it might help direct you in one direction or another, but it doesn't always solve the problem. Just because someone's incapable doesn't mean that the problem is solved by some other individual or just because they're capable doesn't mean we can't do anything. So it's very much a context specific, specific situation and very much based on what's going on in your particular jurisdiction in terms of how will an assessment of capacity help. So another question for you, David, to help out. I'm wondering what tools or protocols people are using when they're assessing capacity in their practice or part of legally mandated assessments in their province or territory. So are there some tools or tricks of the trade that people are already using, protocols, other things? I'm always learning from my audience about this, new, new things that I don't know. Any thoughts, David, from the chat? Mm, not yet. Yet, okay. It's, it's a tricky one. Sometimes people aren't doing these kinds of assessments or haven't have sort of developed mm -hmm. protocols. So that's okay. I was hoping I'd learn something because almost every time I learn about a new protocol or a new acronym or new something. All right, nothing coming? Uh, yes, now they're coming. Oh, now they're coming, okay. Um... What do we got? Something called P-O-E-T or Poet Project from Karen North Lewis. Yeah, I don't know about that one. I look forward to hearing about that. Yeah. And then um, from Melissa Jensen, I really like the capacity assessment guide from the OPG in Alberta. Okay. And then um, 
Lisa mentioned uh, the aphasia, aphasia Institute has an aphasia friendly tool for assessing capacity. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I didn't know about that. Um, and then um, Jessica mentions actually bringing in a geriatrician. Yep. So an expert, you hope. Yeah. Uh, there's okay. something called REACT training in British Columbia that Nicole Mc McAllister mentions. Great. You see, these yeah. are all very specific to different regions, so I wouldn't know about them. So they might be good resources for the group, depending on how transferable they are to other regions. Uh, Thanks. Simon, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Simon, another Mc Simon McDonald says there are long-term care requirements for all new admissions. Okay. Um, then Karen is clarified that the uh, POET stands for Prevention of Error-Based Transfers. Oh, interesting. What POET, a, and she's put the a, website in. Um, yeah, what a lovely acronym. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing and learning more about those. So let me show you my very broad approach. It's, it's Carol's steps one to nine. Uh, it's not specific to you know, the legal mandate in a particular province. It's just the way I try to think about things using bits and pieces from different um, uh, protocols, different things I've read. So for me, one of the first things I'm thinking about step one is what's the trigger? You know, what domain are we talking about? Is it property? Is it capacity to live independently? Is it treatment? What is it that we're thinking about? What domain? And why is an assessment needed? What are people hoping the assessment will do? Uh, is it mandated? Is it necessary because you have to do it, such as uh, getting consent for treatment? You have to decide if someone's capable of giving consent. Other options are the least restrictive options or alternatives other than formal capacity assessments or formal assessments of capacity or the other more creative solutions or other things that could be tried. Who should be doing the assessment? As I said, in certain provinces and certain places, only certain individuals can do that assessment and you may not be the, the right person. And just like I said, in terms of who, how, there might be specific legal requirements, certain forms. So the, the schema I'm most familiar with was, is the capacity assessors in Ontario, for instance, and they have certain guidelines they must follow, certain forms they have to fill out. And I know that's the case for many other provinces as well. The next step I'm thinking about is what do I know about this situation? So what information can I gather or others have told me? What's the situation, the context, the risk? That should be in flashing neon lights because often it's risk or fear of risk or worry about risk or things about risk that make these assessments happen. What are the options? We talked about the fact that people need to be educated about the options. So what are the options for this individual? What are the demands for this situation or decision? So what I mean, what I mean by that is, is that person got a simple financial situation where it's pension check into the account and rent check out, or are they managing a, a, a very large estate? What are the things related to other decisions? So what, what are the sort of mandates that we're talking about? What's the, the, the um, issue that we're, we're talking about? What information do we have about cognition and function? So even though I said it's not a score on the MMSC or a score of MOCA, it's gonna help you know what ballpark you're in if you understand a little bit about that person's cognitive functioning and their actual functioning. And what's very helpful and important is what has been tried and what the outcome was. So that's very important, not only because it gives you a sense of the situation, but it gives you some grist for the mill. And if you're gonna have a conversation with someone, you now know not only a little bit about them, but you can reflect back to them about what's been tried. And of course, if someone says no one ever tried that and you're pretty sure it was tried, then you have evidence of a short-term memory problem or other kinds of cognitive difficulties. So the next step would be really trying to involve or educate the client or the person. So what's the proposed treatment? What is their current financial situation? What are the options if they wanna stay at home living at risk? Um, so helping them understand if possible, this is the status quo, this could be the consequences. If you don't pay your bills, you could be evicted, you could run into financial difficulties. If you don't have this treatment, this could be the consequences. But these are other solutions. You could have this treatment, you could show, choose to have these kinds of people come in to help you, and those are the consequences of those choices. So again, trying to have a conversation and listening as you have this conversation to see whether the person's able to understand and appreciate that. Um, and what kind of, of uh, uptake there is in that conversation. You want to be optimizing their functioning during the assessment. So this is very important. 
And this speaks to the challenge of fluctuating capacity. So how do we find someone in that narrow window when we think they're at their best, when they're fluctuating? What do we do about that? Very, very challenging. But we want to treat reversible conditions. We don't want to be assessing someone if, unless we absolutely have to, who's acutely delirious. You know, I, I've seen assessments where someone's only been in hospital two days. And so why now do we really need to do this assessment about their ability to manage their property? Can it wait? Attention to hearing, language, you know, using proper uh, translators. Time of the day might be important. Uh, in terms of sundowning, it might be important in terms of whether someone's had their pain meds, that might be a good thing or a bad thing. So thinking about optimizing functioning during assessment, accommodations, very important. I think we're going to hear a lot more about that. The lawyers and other human rights folks are much more interested in how did we accommodate so the person could perform the best they could perform during our assessment. We want to be thinking about which vulnerable group they might belong to. So what's their diagnosis? And that's where we all become junior neuropsychologists, junior geriatric psychiatrists, junior geriatricians, whatever specialty group you want to talk about, um, OTs, PTs, anybody who's got a, an expertise and understanding how does a particular diagnosis affect someone's cognitive functioning, someone's reasoning abilities, where might there be problems and where, where might there be strengths? So what do we know about the cognitive functioning? What do we know about their functional abilities? That's gonna help us start to fashion a series of questions to know, hmm, this is where the problems might be and this is where the strengths might be. My next thing is to think about preferences and values and how does this affect current decisions? Was this person always a saver and they're not? Why not? Was this person always living at risk? So is how is that different? How is that not different? We want to be thinking about knowing when to con consult. So communication difficulties, do we need speech language pathologists, legal questions, do we need to call up a lawyer, help with specific populations. I would be really loath to uh, assess someone with an intellectual disability. It's not an area of strength of my mind. Experts in your region, who can you turn to? Then we want to turn to the, the actual problem at hand, which is decision-making capacity. So, Many different schemas look at, at this, you know, does, does the person understand the information? Can they appreciate the relevance to themselves? Can they compare and contrast different choices? Can they rationally manipulate the information? And can they express a consistent choice? You wanna know the laws and procedures in your jurisdiction. And most of them really look at this ability to understand information that's relevant to the decision and the ability to appreciate the consequences of a decision, a lack of decision, one decision over another decision. Unfortunately, there is no uh, probe, there is no test, there is no MRI. The gold standard is a clinical interview and one has to just keep probing and verifying. Can you explain that to me more? I don't quite understand. Help me understand that more and keep talking and keep having that person talk so that you can try to get a, a sense of whether they are able to understand and appreciate. This is the challenge in that little box and that's why it's so difficult. Decision specific probing, of insight and reasoning using specific examples from that patient or client situation. So that's your mission and that's why it's so difficult. So appreciating the problem affects them, thinking about consequential versus comparative and how to devise a set of questions that's gonna help you understand that. And then documentation is very important. It's not only important because the legal forms, it's important to be able to go back and say, what did I say? How did I ask this? How long did I, did I, I spend with that person? And to try to be able to link what you, you, you're finding with potential diagnosis or impairment and to use the relevant language in your jurisdiction and direct quotes are often very, very helpful. So just to go quickly, and I know I don't have a lot of time to cover some basic areas, um, capacity to consent to treatment. Ed Etchells, who's a colleague of mine at Sunnybrook, devised this ACE, which is not the Advocacy Center for the Elderly in Toronto. It's the Aid to Capacity Evaluation. It's very helpful. Series of questions to help you think about how to talk to someone about whether they're capable of consenting to treatment. Finances, um, these are some roles that might be clinician roles. In my jurisdiction, I, as a geriatric psychiatrist, don't have much to do to opine on whether someone's capable to manage their property or not. That's going to be an inpatient psychiatrist or it's going to be a capacity assessor. In other jurisdictions, it might be you. But in some jurisdictions, it will be these kinds of roles that uh, clinicians will pay in play in terms of managing finances. Capacity to live independently, we already heard all about that in terms of the, the chat box, how concerned people are. It's not easily assessed in an office setting. It's not determined by someone's functional status or independence. You could be very dependent on others, 
but more than willing and able to accept help. You need to have people who are able to give it to you and maybe have the money, but many people are very dependent, but capable of, of uh, getting help. You need collateral about that. Uh, determination may not solve the problem. Just because someone's incapable doesn't mean they're going to open the door and let the lovely personal support worker in to give them a bath or to help them with things. It's often not a black or white situation. You want to be exploring things in different domains here. And I've given you a reference, which gives you some guidelines of the kinds of things you want to be asking about. And uh, here's another reference, which is often a helpful guide. You want to probe insight and reasoning related to that person's situation. So how are you doing with the information you know? They're not doing too well. They're not managing. They're not doing, they're not able to take a bath. They're not able to cook. And then to really have them talk to you about what they think they're able to do. My favorite question is, and it's not mine, it came from the former head of the Consent and Capacity Board in my region, how will you know it's time to get help or move? That's a great probe. As close as I have to a probe, that is a great probe. And then you wanna be thinking about what this determination is gonna mean or change. It's not gonna necessarily open up a door and have all this help come in and someone's gonna all of a sudden say, oh yeah, I'm more than happy to have help in the home. Other issues which you've already brought up are fluctuating capacity. I hope we can have some discussion about that. Capacity and risk, that big risk. And then what our roles are in determining capacity. In some jurisdictions, there's a large role for clinicians. In some jurisdictions, there's a much smaller role. So how do we work with lawyers, with banks? Don't get me started with the banks and the power of attorneys problem. With home care providers. So what's our role in a whole system in dealing with capacity issues? I've given you some resources here. One of my colleagues who's a lawyer in Toronto who has her own firm has a great table that looks at the legislation in all the different provinces in case you were interested. Um, there's a good piece for um, the CMPA, which is the uh, insurer for doctors about understanding the challenges faced by doctors and in capacity assessments. Um, I like this ABA, APA handbook. It's the American Bar Association, American Psychological Association. It's quite generic because it has to deal with all 50 states. So it's quite a, a good open-ended guide. And if you're interested to look at the uh, capacity assessments, uh, the guidelines for Ontario, that's the, the way to find those. So I'll stop sharing there. <laughs>